coming, everyone. We are thrilled to have Paul Muldoon here uh, to share his work with us. That's all you're gonna hear from me. I have asked. <laughs> One of our graduate students, Julia Adomo, will now give Paul a brief introduction. Please welcome us. Paul Chuck, welcome everyone, and thank you for being here today. It's an honor to introduce Paul Muldoon, who the Times Literary Supplement has heralded as, quote, the most significant English language poet born since the Second World War. Before we begin, I would like to thank our sponsors for making this exciting event possible. Thank you to Boston College's Burns Library, Irish Studies, the English Department, and the Institute for the Liberal Arts. We are grateful, too, for the support of the Consulate General of Ireland, Boston, and Culture Ireland. It is thanks to these organizations that we can welcome esteemed speakers, such as Paul Muldoon, to Boston College. Paul Muldoon was born in 1951 in County Armagh, Northern Ireland, and studied at the Queen's University of Belfast. He published his first book of poetry, New Weather, in 1973 when he was 21 years old. From 1973 to 1986, he worked in Belfast as a radio and television producer for the BBC. Since 1987, he has lived in the United States, where he is now Howard G. B. Clark Professor at Princeton University and founding chair of the Peter B. Lewis Center for the Arts. Between 1999 and 2004, he was professor of poetry at the University of Oxford, where he is an honorary fellow at Hartford College. And in 2007, he was appointed poetry editor of The New Yorker. A prolific writer, Muldoon is the author of more than 30 poetry collections, including Moist Sand and Gravel, which won the Pulitzer Prize and the Griffin Poetry Prize. His most recent poetry collection, Howdy Skelp, was published in 2021. He has also published collections of criticism, children's books, opera libretti, song lyrics, and works for radio and television. Muldoon's accolades are innumerable, including the John William Corrington Award for Literary Excellence, the Queen's Gold Medal for Poetry, the Seamus Heaney Award for Arts and Letters, and honorary doctorates from 10 universities. His poems often illustrate the complexity of everyday things and events, illuminating the world around us and allowing us to see it in a new way, one that is sharper, more detailed, and more beautiful. His work is also deeply cultural and political, examining the complexities and tensions of the social world of Northern Ireland. Thank you, Professor Paul Muldoon, for sharing your poetry and your perspective with us. Thank you so much for giving us so much through your words, and thank you for being here today. Please join me in welcoming Paul Muldoon. When the master was calling the roll at the primary school in College Lands, you were meant to call back Anshaw and raise your hand as your name occurred. Anshaw meaning here, here and now, all present and correct, was the first word of Irish I spoke. The last name on the ledger belonged to Joseph Mary Plunkett Ward and was followed, as often as not, by silence, knowing looks, a nod and a wink, the master's droll. And where's our little ward of court? I remember the first time he came back. The master had sent him out along the hedges to weigh up for himself and cut a stick with which he would be beaten. After a while, nothing was spoken. He would arrive as a matter of course with an ash plant a sally rod, or finally, the hazel wand. He had whittled down to a whip lash. Its twist of red and yellow lacquers, sanded and polished, and altogether so delicately wrought that he had engraved his initials on it. I last met 
Joseph Mary Plunkett Ward in a pub just over the Irish border. He was living in the open, in a secret camp on the other side of the mountain. He was fighting for Ireland, making things happen. And he told me, Joe Ward, of how he had risen through the ranks to quartermaster, commandant. How every morning at parade, his volunteers would call back and show and raise their hands as their names occurred. Thank you so much for that uh, lovely introduction. <laughs> to be here and, and uh, we want to spend, uh, look, I mean, I'm sure you have some time constraints. Uh, uh, we, we, we go, I think we're meant to go on to about 6.30, something like that, that suits you. I know some people have to go. <clears throat> so anyway, what I plan to do is to read a few old, older poems, a few new ones, and uh, we'll see how we get on. So that one came from, uh, came out in a book that was published in 1980. Anne Shaw, Anne Shaw, and this, this poem was in that same book. It's a poem about the impact of the Cuban Missile Crisis uh, on the little Catholic parish <clears throat> in North Armagh, where I was brought up. And uh, so I'm very familiar with uh, the iconography here. <laughs> and it happened, of course, uh, in that part of the world at, uh, at that time was that we, we were all, I think it's fair to say, forced out to confession. Um, and even though some of us had not really had the opportunity as yet to do a lot of damage, <laughs> if you know what I mean, um, even, even <laughs> despite that, we went down and, uh, and confessed our sins to the priest. Now, in this poem, I think if I were trying to write it now, uh, now I might, might, um, might try to find another way to delineate uh, the father, the priest, from the father, the papa, the pair in the poem. But, uh, I mean, the... Am I spoiling your your? I'm <laughs> spoiling your side of you. Your side lines, I want. Okay. <laughs> the, um, anyway, you know, it's a poem that I suppose, in some sense, is doing something not dissimilar from um, <clears throat> Patrick Kavanagh's, in a very modest, minor way. Uh, not dissimilar from what uh, Patrick Kavanagh's ep epic is doing. That's the poem, if you recall, where he sets um, you know, the local feud uh, between the Duffies and the McCabes, the, their boundary dispute. He sets that uh, against um, Homer and the Iliad. He says, Homer made the Iliad of such a local run. So what we've got here is a little local event what's happening in the confessional, and then on the wider stage, as they say, uh, this world-threatening um, moment, which, by the way, who would have thought that we might be back there uh, in, some, in some guise? It's just, just not we, what we thought was going to happen, I suspect. Anyway, what else should I say? I think that's it. Yeah. Cuba. My eldest sister arrived home that morning in her white muslin evening dress. Who the hell do you think you are running out to dances in next to nothing? As though we hadn't enough bother with the world at war, if not at an end. 
my father was pounding the breakfast table. Those Yankees were touch and go as it was. If you'd heard Patton in our man. But this Kennedy's nearly an Irishman, so he's not much better than ourselves. And him, with only to say the word, if you've got anything on your mind, maybe you should make your peace with God. I could hear May from beyond the curtain. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. I told a lie once. I was disobedient once. And Father, a boy touched me once. Tell me, child, was this touch immodest? Did he touch your breast, for example? He brushed against me, Father, very gently. So, uh, a, few, a few new ones. We'll just take you right up to the modern era. Uh, okay. the, some of these poems have, have a tendency to stop rather than end. <laughs> <laughs> Like Minnie's another thing. Uh, this is a poem about an MRI. And, uh, you know, I think there's a fairly slender body of work, but probably increasing, <laughs> increasing body of work on the MRI. Are you familiar with this phenomenon? <laughs> I, I know some of you have only heard of it. One or two of you perhaps have been through it. You know, it's one of these devices for magnetic resonance imaging. imaging. Magnetic resonance. I can never really remember what it means. MRI. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> it's, uh, you know, at, at a certain point in life, one, you know, begins to enter the realm of the MRI, which is a very good cribbed, cabined, and confined, I don't know the term for it, you know? And uh, I, I, I describe it here as a sarcophagus. Um, I go back to the etymology of that word in the poem. Um, it's a poem for those of you who are interested in how these things get made, which uh, falls into a particular pattern, and it's that of the Sistina. You know, where, if you recall, where these same six words, or something very like them, uh, recur through the body of the poem. And it's a fabulous uh, form uh, for um, anything that has to do with, with actually the crib to cabin down confined, with um, in this case, with, with being um, entering that, the, the zone in which uh, it, one is really constricted in some sense. The mysterious aspect of these uh, traditional forms that, that seem to be particularly um, constricting is that actually they often, uh, paradoxically, allow for terrific um, release. And um, so that, for example, and even in this poem, as with most of my poems, I had no idea what was going to happen next, where it was going, which seems really weird <laughs> when you think of the fact that it's, uh, you know, it has con consigned itself to this particular uh, method. In any case, you get the idea. So what, what turned out, um, it turned out to be somehow a poem that wasn't only engaged with the MRI, but with almost a little history of the human race, including our friends, they're my friends anyway, the Neanderthals. <laughs> Uh, uh, which is why the Straits of Gibraltar, which is a spot, as many of you know, that is particularly associated with uh, Neand the Neanderthals, lots of uh, material <coughs> that they, they found in that zone. 
because I'm going to stop talking <laughs> about it and just read it. Anu, Anu, the goddess Anu, uh, sometimes perceived in the, in the um, in the Irish tradition as the godhead, uh, the goddess uh, the, associated with the Tulha Jadanam sometimes, Anu, Anu, Anu. She appears in various other guises and the, among the old, the gods and goddesses of old Europe, as they say, the MRI. Again and again, we'll put our shoulder to the wheel on which we are broken. Stretched out at the heart of a replica of the stone sarcophagus we once believed to eat flesh. We still have a straight shot at the Strait of Gibraltar, where we first found a shoulder to cry on, long before the flash of an iron-rimmed wheel on a limestone pavement where we first had a little heart to heart, where we first developed our sense of the straight and narrow through the first stone, first rubbed shoulders with pigment traders, first made a colour wheel first thought to flush dyes through our own flesh so as to map what lies within our hearts. First reinvented the wheel that will run straight only with a camber. First gave the cold shoulder to a pigment trader. First chipped away at limestone till it actually looked like stone. First assigned a shoulder flash to the airborne division. First deigned to shoulder the blame for what happened in the heart of Galicia. Long before we learned to lie straight as a die, though the planets wheel and wheel about us. Before we first secured a lodestone to a merchant man. First entered the home straight where ore is crushed in the flush as the heart is oft times crushed. First put our shoulder to that great wheel, saw Anu in the flesh. First learned that a stone-faced doctor has the heart to give it to us straight from the shoulder. That's the MRI. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So let me go back a um, little bit. How are you? I feel very badly. Are oh, there any? What do you say? You all right? Uh, there might be. A, are there any seats over there? Yeah. Yeah. Keep going. That's all good. Yeah. 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 You, you, can, you can take one of these director's chairs. Have you got insurance? Yeah. Probably <laughs> do. Um, so, this is a, a little poem that, like many poems and songs, uh, uses a refrain um, and in which perhaps you'll be keen to 
join in. <laughs> with which you became to join in. In which you became to join. You know what I mean. <laughs> the, the, um, so the, the, it's a poem that's set in a house in uh, just outside Princeton, <clears throat> which was built in about 1750. And of course, in that era, there, as in this part of the world, uh, when they were building a house, they incorporate they we incorporated uh, a lot of horse hair into the plaster. We used to, I used to feel it um, indeed in this house. I used to feel as if I was inside a horse, <laughs> which, which is not the worst thing. <laughs> and uh, the you know. One of the important things about having a house is that you have to do a lot of home improvements. Um, you know, just the, the two things go together. And among the home improvements, there was often a bit of drilling a hole in a wall, right, N necessarily. So this is a poem that uh, has to do with a series of uh, sense impressions through a hole in a wall. And I, let me just see, the house was on the Delaware and Raritan Canal, which is a canal built by Irish people, many of whom died, I think, in the process of digging it. And at, towards the end of the poem, there is a reference to famine in contemporary Africa, very graphic image with which actually the poem began and as, as you know sometimes what the poem is attempting to do is to you know there's, there's an image there's there's a problem there's a knot and it's sort of the poem actually sometimes is leading you know figuring out and finding a way towards that image perhaps <clears throat> is what's happening here. I'm not entirely sure to tell you the truth. Anyway, the, uh, the, 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 the refrain line, the template for it, it changes each time. So um, uh, you, you'll be alert each time it comes up, I know. But the basic template is with a pink and a pink and a pinky pick. Shall we run through it? <laughs> with a pink and a pink. We go from pink to pink each time, some version of that. So, should we have a go? Yeah. Okay, here we go. The loaf. When I put my finger to the hole, they've come out for a dimmer switch. In a wall of plaster, stiffened with horse hair. It seems I've scratched a 200-year-old itch with a pink and a pink and a pinky pick. When I put my ear to the hole, I'm suddenly aware of spades and shovels turning up the game all the way from Raritan to the Delaware with a clink and a clink and, and a, a clinky click. <laughs> when I put my nose to the hole, I smell the flood plain off the canal after a hurricane. And the spots of green grass where thousands of Irish have lain with a stink and a stink and a stinky stick. When I put my eye to the hole, I see one holding horse dung to the rain in the hope, indeed, indeed, of washing out a few whole ears of grain with a wink and a wink and a winky wink. 
And when I do at last succeed in putting my mouth to the horsehair fringed niche, I can taste the small loaf of bread he baked from that whole seed with a link Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, now let me see. I think I'll go back and read a read a newish one. <clears throat> uh, this is a this is a poem. I read this little one. So <clears throat> we've just moved um, to a new apartment in New York in what was a, a hard tack factory. Hard tack in the sense of sea biscuit. A factory where they made this, in, as, as, you, as the name would suggest, this incredibly hard biscuit, which was met, which was, are you all okay there? Which was, um, which was, however hard it was, it certainly, it was no match for the weevil. <laughs> and, and the, you know, these biscuits apparently were riddled with weevils. And uh, you know, there are accounts of the sailors out in the middle of the ocean, uh, you know, softening the, the, the hard tack. So they, you had to soften it somehow to eat it. And they put it maybe in, in some water or maybe beer or something like that. And so this is very early in the day for this detail, perhaps, <laughs> right after nine o'clock. But you know, the weevils would be coming out of the hard time. Uh, sort of graphic stuff. Those of you who are devotees of Samuel Pepys may recall that actually Pepys, as the sec I think it was the Secretary of the Navy in, the, in England, um, he actually was a, was a great champion of hardtack. He, he really put hardtack on the map <laughs> or, or something like it. Um, I think that's as much as I need to say. <laughs> Again, this poem takes one of these inherited forms, as they're known, traditional forms. <clears throat> and this particular one um, is uh, the quatern. And as I'm sure many of you might have uh, guessed, one of the reasons people like myself went into the poetry business in the first place was because we were, we had been persuaded that in general, it was a form that was quite short. <laughs> and therefore would not be taking up a lot of time and, and actually therefore would not be taking up a lot of energy because you know you need that for other things um, and the quatern <clears throat> you know uh, seems very very much suited to that world view in that the first line of the first of the four stanzas is the second line of the second stanza and the third line of the third stanza and the fourth line of the fourth stanza. So if you get a, uh, that, that means if you get a line, you know, it sort of cuts down on the, <laughs> cuts down on the effort substantially. Anyway, so this is hard tech that a ship's biscuit might yet see us through our circumnavigation of the globe is testimony to its shelf life. True. Though your nonchalant doffing a bathrobe makes me think you're also playing for keeps. That a ship's biscuit might yet see us through 
may be traced back partly to Samuel Pepys and his time in the Navy. Partly to our weevil sense. It's easier to chew when first softened behind the lower lip. That a ship's biscuit might yet see us through from the time we weighed anchor at Pike Slip to our pretty much having learned the ropes vindicates our taking the longer view and persisting pretty much in the hope that a ship's biscuit might yet see us through. Um, thank you for So, you know, I'll do another one on that then. Same little, same little, um, same verse form, for what it's worth. Um, and it's called A Graveyard in New England. And the basic, uh, I concede, I suppose, of the idea is that, um, you know, as you, as you know better than I do in this part of the world, so much effort was put into clearing the uh, land of stones, right? All except for one field. A graveyard in New England. Although we've spent so much time clearing fields, it seems a plow does little more than scratch the surface of the land we'd hoped would yield 100 pumpkins from the pumpkin patch and represent a hundredfold increase. <coughs> Although we've spent so much time clearing fields and taken out quite a lengthy lease on this hacked rim of the Canadian shield. Only recently <coughs> has it been revealed it's not just in our beds lovers must bundle. Although we've spent so much time clearing fields, it seems we've simultaneously <coughs> trundled granite blocks, boulders, and boundary terms into a single tract in which we've sealed their fates <coughs> and are quite bent on holding firm, although we've spent so much time clearing fields. <coughs> so, um, back to book and well, how are we all down here? <laughs> any observations? Queer? I see the suns in your eyes. Um, any observations, queries, concerns, complaints? <laughs> Maybe lodged with management, but <laughs> <laughs> any observations or thoughts? We do so, since we're doing, since we have a, since it's a fairly intimate uh, occasion, any thoughts at all? Not required. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Did you plan for the graveyard one since you know there's a graveyard right near our campus? You know, mm -hmm. um, I'm fascinated. The first time I came to America, I was fascinated. Actually, before I came to America, <coughs> um, before I, I think before I came here, I met someone who, who one of whose claims to fame was that they owned a graveyard. And they had a graveyard. I mean, of course, this is not a, not an uncommon thing, in some sense, the family plot. Um, but no, I mean, it is, one of the problems with the poem, I think, often is that when you when one begins, as I did begin actually in, in the introduction, uh, to to you know give it, it's, it's good as before the poem flies past your ear, I think, to have some little sense of 
what might be coming because it does fly by your ear and you don't really have much of a chance to grab it as it goes by. But, <clears throat> you know, somehow the minute one begins to do the elevator pitch, as it were, for the poem, or the, or the brief pressy for it, uh, you know, it's the, it, it, even as I was saying, well, it's about all this clearing of the fields and then there's this one field, it sounds kind of banal, and perhaps it is, and yet it's kind of central to who we are. Uh, so it was no particular where I, uh, yes it was no particular field but uh, but it is set in New England uh, so perhaps perhaps but I mean I think often the poem knows better than one does certainly in my case it always knows better you know so the poem you know will find that it's truth, maybe, if one's terribly lucky, if one allows it. Um, any other thoughts at all? Yes. Uh, you know, sorry, yeah, please, yeah. Just, just we heard at the uh, beginning that uh, you, you pick ordinary uh, things of graveyard or uh, horse hair. Or whatever. Where did you come up with the, uh, the, the biscuit? The biscuit. Um, so the question had to do with the, these ordinary things. I mean, it's not. You know, I'm not. I think the so. ship's biscuit. Yes, the ship's biscuit. You know, it's. I don't. It's not that I. I in particular sit around <coughs> thinking, well, let me come up with an ordinary thing. Uh, though, though, I mean, there are many poems. I think through the history of, of uh, poetry in English. Let's just take that or what passes for English, let's say Anglo-Saxon, you know, which, um, or, you know, something's, no, but in the sense that it's thought to be, you know, <laughs> some, somewhat different language. But, you know, the Anglo-Saxon riddles, for example, in the Exeter book, you know, they're about, you could easily have a poem about a weevil or a biscuit as the answer to one of those riddles, you know? The ordinary things. I mean, what is ordinary? What is extraordinary? You know, where, how do we, how, where do we make that call? Um, I suppose is one of the questions that, uh, that uh, is constantly been raised in our lives. You know, and while it's true that, you know, one poet may announce, you know, well, my subject matter is, you know, of man's first disobedience, right? And they embark on paradise lost. Not everyone uh, in every poem is taking on, you know, <laughs> the big subject. <laughs> uh, again, the big subject, the little subject. I think one of the great one of the things one learns, I think, is that there's nothing as big, nothing as small, nothing as low, nothing as high. Uh, I'd say, you know, that's one of our discoveries. It's all part of the same, part of the same thing. So the sea biscuit factory, as I perhaps did not adequately explain, we actually live in a for, an old sea biscuit factory. And one of the things <clears throat> that poets, as we all do, actually, whether we're poets or not or try to write poems or not, is try to figure, is to, as you were just saying about the graveyard here, when you're in, uh, you know, when you're in Boston College, you, what, what are your environs? What happened in this vicinity? Who lived here over the centuries? You know? Um, we, we naturally want to know, or many of us want to know, um, about the history of the place that, in which we find ourselves. And <clears throat> um, that's certainly how many poets begin. The history of the place, the language of the <clears throat> place. So <clears throat> it's all part of where do I live? And uh, I mean, we have, moved, we have moved around a great deal over the years and one of the really refreshing things about it is that, uh, you know, it means that 
one has never stopped for something to ride a bike. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, very crudely. I mean, and when I discovered that we were moving into a sea biscuit factory, immediately I felt a sea biscuit palm. <laughs> Coming on. <laughs> I did. I was quite excited. But the problem then is, of course, and, the, and the, you know, to go back to the MRI, it's conceivable. I mean, I, then I wonder, well, has this single poem even begun to do justice to the subject of the sea biscuit? <laughs> Which could, if it isn't already, be the subject of what, you know, the, the title of one of those books, like Salt or Sugar <laughs> or. In fact, maybe that's what I should be doing. <laughs> I was writing a history of the human race. Uh, through the, you know, the prism, as it were, <laughs> of the sea biscuit. <laughs> so if you, if you were one to get involved in the sea biscuit as a concept, the truth is you could write about sea biscuits for the rest of your life. <laughs> Would you want to? Probably not. Would anyone want to read it? That depends. <laughs> it could conceivably be really interesting. Because here's the thing. The subject matter of a poem is totally irrelevant, if you think about it. If a poem may be about anything, and that certainly seems to be the case, it doesn't actually matter. I would suggest. Someone else will. Uh, I'll do this. Yeah. So on form, do you find that you are writing a poem and it wants to arrive at a certain form, or do you sometimes, like a sestina or a quatrain, do you, do you start often with a form to assign yourself and say, I'm going to write one of those? You know, <clears throat> in general, did you hear the question? Do, do you set out to write within a particular form, or do you, or, or does it announce itself? And I think ideally, however strange it may sound, it tells you what it wants to be. Now, it does sound a bit weird because, I mean, I've written a few sustainers. Every time I write a sustainer, I have to go to, you know, how to write a sustainer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do. I do, because nobody in their right mind, nobody, no sane person, I would suggest to you, knows the sequence in which the end words in the sustainer uh, fall. If you know that, you've probably got a problem. <laughs> so each time, what? I'm sorry, please forgive me. For <laughs> no, I'm sure you don't. <laughs> but, you know, so my, the point is, though, if, you, if one starts out and there's line one, right, and it's going along, and then you get to line two, by the time you get to the end of line two, there are certain things that have become clear. You know, if, it does, if it's not going to rhyme, for example, well, it's probably not, it's not going to be in couplets. And then by the time you get to the end of line, uh, line end of line three, other things become clear. Um, but ideally, ideally, there's a sense that this construction wants to be in the world in, roughly speaking, this shape, right? And science. It's one of the reasons why the sonnet, I'd say, has been you know, such a durable form. It's not even, it's as much to do with its duration in the world, the amount of space it takes up in the world as anything else. <clears throat> and also, you know, with, with variations, how it functions, um, you know, and by way of argument, we've got this, and then we've got that, and we've got against that, we have this. So, but I think ideally, Ideally, it tells you how it wants to be. And one, one's job is to try to allow it to be what it most might be, um, without any preconceptions about what that might look like. So anyway, uh, maybe I'll read another couple of poems. 
but or unless there's someone else with the press I did someone else have um, something to say or yeah what do we say well you know maybe I'll read a sonnet since I just mentioned one oh here's one um hold on a second let me see where it is I think it's a sonnet. It is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a kind of a sonnet. It's written in uh, it's written in couplets as it happens, which is not necessarily typical of rhyming couplets. Um, so it's a poem having to do with the phenomenon of during the first and certainly first and second world wars um, of various pieces of hard wood including wood found in banisters being repurposed for military use mm. right and you know this was a feature in certainly the <coughs> the UK, Great Britain, and Northern Ireland, the technical term, the UK. You know, quite often you'll see, uh, as many of you have, um, railings that have been stripped. You can see where iron railings have been cut down, uh, supposedly to be melted down and then used in the war effort. This is something that, that, that people tell me uh, didn't really <clears throat> kick in until the Second World War with the discovery of epoxy of acetylene, which really made it easier to cut these things down. There's some talk that actually, uh, this is too much information actually, there's some, 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 some commentators believe that really it had more to do with keeping the home fires burning, keeping the spirits up, the sense of resolve among the populace, rather than actually the extent to which this melted down <coughs> railing would ever uh, truly make a difference in the war effort, leaving that to one side. Uh, that's the basic conceit of the poem. <coughs> the banisters. Our ornamental gates <coughs> and railings that were melted down for rifle barrels have gained some sort of posthumous renown by unambiguously drawing a line in the sand. The gates and railings are finally taking a firm stand <clears throat> and even more emphatically bringing things to a close. The exit wound is their approximation of a rose or a geranium under gauze on the windowsill. <clears throat> Gangrene, the green and gold of the first full-blown daffodil also rendered so it would even more tellingly rend was lead stripped from the gutters and flashing for lead will bend along a spine as it did along a walnut ridge post what was once an outer sanctum is now the innermost. Shouldered as rifle stocks, after a mere three weeks of drill, the banisters are gradually taking another hill. <laughs> Um, let me see, I might just, uh, I think I'll end with, um,
<clears throat> yeah, I think I'm going to end the poem about, uh, having to do with, I say about, having to do with um, stamina, I suppose. Um, and it's a poem about bullishness. Um, I mean, stam we admire stamina. I mean, there are aspects of stamina that are not necessarily so admirable, I think one has to say. You know, one can be bullish about all sorts of things. Uh, so if, I'm not sure if it has any intrinsic merit, um, dedication, single-mindedness, no. Uh, yet, I mean, the times, I suppose, there are, there are aspects of it that are not, not, um, not to be ruled out, not to be sneezed at. And so this is a poem having to do with the urge to keep going. And <clears throat> I'm, I'm, it will coincide with my stopping. <laughs> And that'll be a good thing. And I just want to say what a pleasure it has been to be here. And thank you so much to Marjorie, my dear friend, and so many here. Um, what a pleasure to be here and to see you all. And I look forward to spending, <clears throat> at least with some of you, a day or two. I'm looking forward to being in a class or two, a meeting or two. And thank you so much for your lovely welcome. And here's my bullish, uh, here's my description of a bull, a bull. Um, every day, putting a fresh spin on how he maintains that shit-eating grin, <laughs> despite his notoriously thin skin. <laughs> the quagmire of what might have been. Every day, shouldering an invisible tray, hello, hello, ole, ole, <laughs> is musing on how best to waylay a hiker passing through a field of Galloways. Every day, aiming to swat the single fly that keeps tying and untying a knot before taking another pot shot, rolling through the Krishna Valley like a juggernaut. Every day trying to err on the side of standing firm, four square, the single-mindedness of a Berber about to take out a French legionnaire. <laughs> Every day getting through by dint of three of his four hooves being napped flint, hanging out the bloody bandage of his hint hint, barber's pole, his stick of peppermint. Get the, get the idea? <laughs> Every day his hoof prints in the sand strewn park have enclosed so much in quotation marks. Not even Job or Abraham Hark Hark is a patch an R patriarch. Every day the holy show of leather dyed Robin's egg blue by Tiffany and Co. Areas strictly off limits, strictly no go. The wilds of Connaught, the stockyards of Chicago. Every day rising at 5 a.m. Determined to stem the flow of misinformation from the well at Zem Zem, his dangle straw from a crib in Bethlehem. Every day fighting shy of the possibility his eye is a shellac gudge from an old hi-fi, his helmet appropriated from a samurai. Every day the mob threatening a hatchet job. They're hobbling across concrete, hobnob, hobnob. Their sidelong glances at his thingamabong. Every day, the urge to rut 
at odds with his yen for whole grain calf nuts. The my my and tut tut of that bevy of cattle at their scuttlebutt. Every day his own cows lick, even more at odds with his almighty mick. How come his second cousin, the Dick Dick, gets to trip the light fantastic? Every day taking a buy before settling back to plow the riddy die die of a Filipino swamp buffalo or carabao. Every day plotting how to get even, even with the get who's trolling him on the internet. <laughs> Under the vapor trails of the jet set, the solidity of his silhouette. Every day his image picked out in tin to signify there being room at the inn. Bottoms up, chin chin, the gulping of milk punch from a pannikin. Every day cruising the main drag in anticipation of raising his own red flag to the plaza's ragtag bunch of scamps and scallywags. Every day forced to cram for some big exam. The difference between quandam and quamdam, the origins of the dithyram. Every day a razor, every night a strop. Rush tickets for Carmen at the Met cost $25 a pop. Yeah, move on, would you? Chop, chop. A world in which so much art is agit prop. Every day taking a hit from some little shit, armed with the latest version of lit crit. <laughs> the fly still looping the loop in his Messer Schmidt. Every day, it would seem, rekindling a flame against the culture of shame and its interminable blame game. Every day, countering a counterclaim. Every day, forced to pit himself against holy writ and the nitwit for whom the last sky paintings are counterfeit. Every day, having to whisk away the versifiers, a verse to risk the ignominy of being supplanted tisk tisk by a ram on an Egyptian obelisk. Every day lying down with the lamb. What might have been? More water over the dam. Having to meet the future head on. One bam. His muzzle, a spermicide slick diaphragm. Every day, the thrill of balancing a natural proclivity and an acquired skill. After a walk on heart in cattle drive with chill wills, his tongue turquoise teal from chlorophyll. Every day, learning not to pin his hopes on their being grain in the bin. The situation supposedly win-win when he mounts an upholstered Holstein mannequin. Every day, the likelihood of a snub from a warble grub, <coughs> even as he rises above the hub hub. Every day, the flash freezing of his syllabub. Every day, busting sound while straddling a divining rod. His permanent disdain for the God Squad by whom he was once overawed. Every day contending with the holier than thou attitude associated with the sacred cow. Cow time and powwow being terms he's now obliged to disavow. Every day cutting some slack to the youths leaping over his back at Knossos. His dream of trading endless akak for a week on the Concord and Merrimack. Every day starting to dig with his one obsidian hoof through the rigs, a lily pad where a big wig flies in and out in some sort of wordy game. Every day muddling through, thanks to his tried and true ability 
to rise above the general to-do by thinking of it all as deja vu. Every day chewing gum like a teddy boy in a bombed out slum. As for his success in rising above the humdrum, for a moment only, only a modicum. Every day striking a blow against a more or less invisible foe. A life lived in slow-mo ever since a shoot opened at the rodeo. Every day creating a stink against being pushed to the brink by the powers that be not known wink wink with their new speak and double think every day those massive chords on the synth as he's rabble roused from his plinth he's taking everything to the nth degree despite being consigned to a labyrinth every live long day making of his hide a parish encircling thong, his panko encrusted balls, a delicacy in Hong Kong, <laughs> subsisting on a diet of mashed kurajong. Every day, waiting for someone to deign to give him free rein. That shit eating grin, how's it maintained? running rings around a mill that crushes sugarcane. Every day trying to weigh in the scales those who still flay the burnt offering and those who nay say such exaltation of the everyday. Every day making a dry run for either his moment in the sun or an air injection captive boat stun gun. The china shop of a skeleton. Thank you. Wow.